Hello. Thank you for watching my book review. <coughs> I finished reading this book a couple weeks ago. There we go. <coughs> and here are my thoughts on this. Overall, two thumbs up. It was a good book. <coughs> Written by, of course, Mike Huckabee, current presidential candidate. Former presidential candidate who didn't make it, uh, didn't win the primary uh, eight years ago, <coughs> but didn't run four years ago. Hmm. And a former Fox News host. Why didn't he just stick with his TV show? <sighs> I saw a children's Christmas book at one store recently that had uh, his name on the cover too. <coughs> I oh, didn't write notes for this, so we're going off of memory. Um, the first thing I want to tell you about this book is what the overall format is. The format of this book is like he is writing to, from his perspective, he is uh, conservative, and he was raised in the South. Um, he is a Christian. His perspective um, and his experience, he's writing about it, um, and it's a mixture of his experience and gets down to specific issues and what he thinks about the specific issues. <coughs> um, and the, the, uh, the way he's writing it is to people who live in New York, Los Angeles, uh, Washington, D.C., to help them see what it's like to come from the South, um, what some, uh, some growing up experiences are that are common to people who grew up in the South poor when he was growing up. <coughs> um, and before I read this book, I had never thought of uh, deep fried food as health food, but he was talking to a doctor named Bill Frist one time and um, asked the doctor what to do for your health if you're visiting a country where you're not sure the food is safe. And this uh, heart surgeon, Bill Frist's response was drink Coca-Cola and french fries. <laughs> and and the, the, uh, the southern deep fried everything um, tradition may have started when not everyone had refrigerators to keep their food from spoiling but they didn't want to starve to death so if you deep fry some meat that's been sitting out and uh, didn't get a chance to put into a refrigerator because you didn't have one it might kill off the bacteria and turn it into something safe to eat and if you're talking about you know decades ago when this uh, deep fry everything culture um, was becoming established, there were a lot more people who were manual laborers. And if you're moving your body all day long, you need some calories. Deep fried gives you those calories. Now, <laughs> that same diet might be harmful to somebody who doesn't need it because they have a refrigerator and they drive to work and at work they sit down in a chair for eight hours but, you know, deep fried food has its time and its place. <coughs> uh, yeah, most of the things I agree with him on. Um, one of the things he talks about in this book, and it's not the first time I heard him advocate it, is that um, <coughs> he calls it a fair tax. He should not call it a fair tax. That's deceptive labeling. Call it a national sales tax. It does not take you 10 minutes to say national sales tax. And it's more accurate and descriptive. Fair. I, <coughs> I am extremely unconvinced that it's a good idea to create a national sales tax and um, one reason is I kind of like how the income tax 
less people who aren't rich. You know, it is based to some degree on what money you have so that people still can get what they need. Um, <coughs> and so uh, some people that advocate for the national sales tax uh, advocate for it because right now people work under the table to avoid paying income taxes. Uh, that prostitute uh, that you drive by and don't stop for, uh, but gets money from somebody else that stops, she's not paying income taxes. But if we implement a national sales tax, well, one, you need to be worried about making a new tax without getting rid of the old. Mike Huckabee does advocate getting rid of the income tax simultaneously. Um, but you got to be careful that yeah, if we ever do try his idea that I think it's a bad idea, make sure that is one indispensable part of his idea that I don't disagree with. If you're going to get start a national sales tax, don't make a new tax without getting rid of the old one. Not shrinking it down, not cutting it, gone completely. If you create if you create a national sales tax, there will be people trying to get away from it. There will be people who are run a little small business off to the side that, uh, or people claiming stuff was stolen when it was, and or people hoping they're just too small to be for the IRS to be worried about it. You're still going to have that. One argument for the national sales tax is the IRS is corrupt. There have been certain individual IRS agents who have done corrupt things, and they should be dead by now. Um, we should uh, attacking political opponents should be a death penalty, uh, should get you the death penalty. The government is not there to attack political opponents. <coughs> um, and government agents should uh, leave their personal political opinions out of their decisions, and Lois Lerner definitely did not. <coughs> but, creating a national sales tax, I don't think will entirely solve that problem. Because there will still be people who, you know, bribe the president, make a big campaign contribution, and get there not paying it overlooked. Get some favorable accounts, you know, decisions by the new IRS. There's always going to be some agency that collects taxes. That's what the IRS is. <coughs> I, we, can, we can look at the problems with the IRS and try to rein them in without creating a new tax and hallucinating to ourselves that there will be no IRS following it. I mean, no other agency with a different name that does the same thing the IRS does collect the tax. <coughs> okay. So the uh, chapters... Let's see. A new American outcast people who put faith and family first, guns and why we have them, that was one of my f more favorite uh, sections of this. Guns don't kill people. They sit there and don't move until people touch them. And maybe I'm going to make a video along those lines sometime soon. Uh, culture of crude. Uniform diversity. An oxymoron. Salt, sugar, soda, smokes, and so much more. Can you hear, hear me now? The NSA can. Okay, so that's one thing I agree with him on. As I'm troubled, uh, disturbed, and wonder if the National Severe National Security Agency ta keeping a track of every single phone call in, in the country that ever happens is crossing the line. It's not helping anything, it's not catching bad guys, and it's not um, and, and it's not constitutional. <laughs> um, Same-sex marriage and the law. Gods and man. He had some good arguments to make about that, how marriage is man and woman, all grown up, personal freedom, get off my lawn, bend over and take it like a prisoner. Um, that one talks about what he thinks about the TSA. Reality culture TV. <coughs> yeah, he pointed out the first reality TV show was in the 1970s. I don't remember that one. <coughs> And the uh, family ended up getting divorced, and you have to wonder if it was the stress of the cameras there and the whole world knowing what their little tiny, what would have otherwise been little tiny arguments were. But I think it's a good sign for a culture that uh, some of the most popular reality TV shows have not been the crude, vulgar uh, reality shows, but have been Duck Dynasty. 
There's this family that's deeply religious um, <clears throat> that isn't having sex and getting drunk every episode. Um, and uh, they rename the show every time Bob and Jim Bob and uh, Jill is her first name, I think. Uh, no, was that the daughter? Jim Bob and what's his wife? Um, Duggar have kids. And I like to watch that show. I should remember. Michelle, Michelle, Michelle. It's Michelle. Okay, Jim Bob and Michelle. Um, but they're another uh, example of a popular TV show, reality show, that's not a bunch of sex and drunkenness and people doing outrageous things. Let's see. Envir bailing out the big boys. Environmentalist hypocrisy. Schools out, mass exodus from public schools, regulation plus taxation plus litigation equals job migration, the United States is befall falling behind other nations, grenades in our tents. That chapter, it's not obvious from the chapter heading what that one is about. That's how Republicans should not be so hard on each other. Um, that's not helping if you're... Uh, uh, in the primaries getting too vicious in your attacks against your opponents and then you have to go talk about the if you if you're going to uh, advocate for the presidential candidate that your party nominated it doesn't sound believable if two months ago you were saying the most heinous things he's a devil worshiper he's he's crazy Two months later, oh, so and so, he's a great guy. He's he's good. We should have him. We can trust him to run our country right, and trust him to respect your religious freedom. Uh, yeah, it's, it's not very believable if you have a big change like that. And he pointed out that uh, yeah, one uh, one fact that he pointed out that uh, was interesting food for thought. Um, some people, when he's been running for president, have talked about what happened in his state or been looking at what happened in his state when he was the governor and looking too hard or lo not looking deep enough. And what do I mean by lo looking too hard or not looking deep enough? He pointed out in here that when he was the governor, the, the uh, state legislature was 90-something percent Democrat, which means you are being stupid if you say, oh, in that state when he was the governor, this happened. Ah, okay. You should, you're looking too hard if you're going to make a lot of emphasis about what happened when he was governor in the state. When he was the governor, not dictator. There's a legislature he had to compromise with and work with. Or you're not looking deep enough if when you find out what happened there, if you don't look at, was he for it or against it? Was there a veto overridden? Did he need to make a compromise? Sometimes a governor will need to make a compromise with the legislature. He would rather things be very different, but be the governor, not the, uh, not the dictator. I've thought about that subject before when people were accusing Mitt Romney of uh, being a moderate or a liberal or uh, Steve Dace was one butthead I won't listen to on the radio again. Um, he's not one of us. He's one of them. Because why? When he was the governor in a state that was majority Democrat legislature, he had to make compromises with them. You can't look at what Romney did in Massachusetts. Um, you're being stupid if you say, oh, in Massachusetts this and this happened. If you don't look at it and say to yourself, well, Maybe he had to make compromises. You have to look at what he wanted to do, because he was he had to make compromises sometimes. <sighs> and it's kind of poetic that one of the groups, uh, Pat Toomey, who was involved with one of the groups that was uh, advocating against Mike Huckabee in the primaries when he was running for president. <laughs> and uh, Pat Toomey, uh, a little bit later on, uh, made a compromise that uh, I don't think there was any justification for Pat Toomey's compromise, but it's kind of poetic justice. Pat Toomey didn't want to find out if, uh, or the group that he was involved with, um, didn't want to find out if Mike Huck Huckabee had to make compromises when he was the governor. 
and just said, this happened, he was governor, that's it. And now Mike Toomey's uh, on some uh, group's uh, not liked list uh, <clears throat> because of what Pat Toomey maybe would call a compromise he needed to make. <sighs> and he was, you know, haranguing somebody else for compromise that needed to be made. Uh, rules for reformers. Redneck remedies. The difference between killing pigs and making sausage. And then Beyond Bumper Stickers. Thank you for watching this. You have a good day.